Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our reading for today is from Genesis 3, and it is the fall into sin. Now, when the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of, God, of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the, certain dece the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and also take the tr of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which it, he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden uh, at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned away to guard, or turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with us in this moment, that you would still the distractions around us, focus our hearts and our minds on you and your word. And that by the power of your spirit, we would understand it, that we would be changed and moved by it. I pray that you would be with me as I speak uh, speak today, as I, as I preach, that you would give me the words to say that I would preach faithfully what you have written in your word. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So here we are. It's it's today. We're we're going to be talking about the fall and sin, and that's a tough one. Right? That is a difficult conversation to have. And quite frankly, I'm impressed with you all who are here because not too many people would get up in the morning and be like, "Hey, let's go watch something that tells us or asks us the question." What's wrong with you? So kudos to you. You're here, and I hope you stay. I hope you stay. But it's a difficult conversation to have. In fact, we usually kind of shy away from this, don't we? We we think, you know, we don't really talk about the sin thing. Or if we're going to, let's at least talk about you know their sins. We don't need to talk about my sins. You know, so if we're going to talk about the fall, let's talk about Adam and Eve. We don't need to, we don't need to talk about me. You know, but in general, we just kind of shy away from us. Let's let's just talk about being nice to people and, and about love and forgiveness and heaven and, and all those wonderful things. And those are wonderful things. But we need to talk about sin too. Right? We need to have both law and the gospel because both are truth. And quite frankly, if you don't know that you're sick, why would you take the cure? So we need to know the problem. We need to understand it. We need to know that. And that means we need to know the truth as God has shown it to us in his word. And I'll tell you what, you could make a good argument that the doctrine of sin, right? The teachings that we have in the Bible about sin are one of the most, that's one of the most important doctrines that we have in the church. Because it helps us to understand who we are and what our situation is, as well as point us to the Savior that we need. And truth is in short supply these days, isn't it? It is hard to know what is true anymore. We have, our society has just kind of rejected the concept of truth and reality. We just say, whatever I want to think it is. The truth is, is whatever I say is the truth. And if you disagree with me, well, then that's your truth, but I have my truth. And who are you to say that my truth is wrong, you know? And so we say, you know, if it, if it looks right and it smells right and it feels right to me, then, then it must be right for me, even if it's not for you. Where have we heard that before? Wasn't that literally what Eve said? Isn't that what she said? She, it's, you know, the, certain, the serpent comes and says, hey. Why don't, you, why don't you try some of this fruit? And she said, no, no, no. God said that we shouldn't, we shouldn't eat that fruit or even touch the tree, which, by the way, he hadn't said. But we shouldn't do that. And then the serpent says, well, but that's just because God doesn't want you to be like him. This is going to make you like him. It's going to make you wise. And then it says that Eve looked at the tree and saw that it was good for food. And she saw that it looked good and it was going to taste good. And then that it would be good for wisdom for her. And she ate. Right? If it looks right, if it smells right, if it feels right to me, then it must be right to me. Forget about whether God said that it was wrong. Forget about whether he warned me that it would lead to my death. I'm choosing to do this. Right? And that is what we do. That is what we do in our society. And in fact, we don't just do it ourselves, but we bring others along with us, right? We usually, we tend to now look at this through a lens of a community because we've come to realize that the whole, you know, I have my truth, you have your truth. It works maybe in an argument between two or three people. But at some point, if you're the only one who's saying something, you're going to have to face the reality when everyone else tells you that you're wrong or at least face the consequence that they enforce on you for being wrong, or at least wrong in their eyes. And then what does that do? That just leads to a a situation where the greatest, uh, the loudest voice or the majority gets to say what's right and what's wrong just according to their own whim. And at that point, the only sin becomes political incorrectness to speak against what the majority has said or what the loudest people have said. There's no basis in reality. There's no basis in truth. But I'll tell you what, if you think about that concept, right? If it feels good to me, then I should do it. How can something be wrong if it feels so good to me? If you think about where that leads to, 
what the end point of that is, that is a very scary world to live in. I wouldn't want to live in that world. Truth is important. And the truth only comes from God. Right? We need the truth. And we need the truth about sin just as much as we need the truth about Jesus. Because the truth is that the problem that you have is a lot worse than you think it is. But the good news is that the solution that God has is much greater than you know it is. That is what the truth tells us. And the truth about sin, it reveals so much to us. It opens our eyes to so many things around the world. You know, when people ask, how come bad things happen to good people? What God has told us about sin, it tells us, well, there are no good people. That's the answer. You know, today is September 11th, right? And I remember when the attacks of 9-11 happened. And shortly after, afterwards, there were a lot of people who were asking the question, how could God allow all those innocent people to die? But the uncomfortable truth was that there were no innocent people in those buildings. They were all sinners, just like you and just like me. In fact, when we understand that, we realize that it's by God's grace that we don't all die for our sins. It should be the moment that we do it. We're gone, but no. In God's grace, he sustains us and he gives us those opportunities to see the Savior that he sent us. There's grace there. And it shows us, you know, answers other questions about life, about why we do the things that we do, why others do the things that we do, even when we don't want to. You know, we, we, we see these problems in our lives. And we say, I got to fix this. So, so we go to a therapist or we go online and we start to research things and we try to figure out why am I doing these things that I, that I shouldn't be doing and how can I fix it? How can I make it better? But we understand sin. We understand why we do these things. In Romans 7, Paul writes this amazing passage where he describes a situation that every single one of us, at least every single one of us who believe in Jesus have experienced. And he says this, he says, the things that I want to do, I don't do them. But the things that I don't want to do, those are the things that I keep doing. And what is he saying there? He's saying, I, I want to do all these good things. I want to serve God in all these ways. And yet I keep not doing those things. But the things that I know God has told me not to do, those things I keep doing. And how many times have we done that? How many times in our lives have we said, you know what? I, I, I'm trying to read the Bible more. I'm trying to pray more. I'm trying to be more generous. I'm trying to do all these things. And yet I, I don't. You know, or I'm trying to stop, I'm, going to, I'm trying to stop gossiping, or I'm trying to stop lusting, or I'm trying to stop holding on to bitterness and, and all these things. And yet those things just keep holding on to me. I keep doing them. And that's what Paul is describing. And as he describes this, he does something interesting. He describes sin as though it was a thing that is alive in us. Something that is at work inside of us. This alien thing that is causing us to do things. Right? And that gives us a picture of what sin is. That sin is greater than just the things that we do. You know, a lot of times we think, well, I, I do things that are sins. And yes, you do. But those are the symptoms of sin. Of the original sin. Of the sinful nature that is a part of you. Right? It goes down much deeper than those actions and those thoughts that you have. Because those things come out of that sinful nature, that original sin that we are conceived in. We understand that sin is deeper. Because right? if we think sin is, is a sickness, then 
you know, we're going to try to find a cure. And if we think that sin is a mental disorder, then we're going we're gonna to go to therapy. And if we think that it's ignorance, we're going to seek education. If we think it's weakness, we look for a trainer. But what did it say in our passage from Romans 5? It said, therefore, sin, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Right? It started with Adam, and then it passed on from one generation to the next. In fact, at creation, right, God created Adam and Eve in his own image. But then they fall. They give in to sin. And then when they have children, it says that those children were now not in the image of God, but in the image of Adam. That sinful nature passed on. And when we see sin as captivity, as idolatry, as the creature usurping the place of the creator, as a heart that has been disconnected from God, we realize that it's so much deeper than we thought. And we start to deal with our own problems and even the problems of others in a different way, in a right way, because we realize that what we really need is not more education or, or to be trained better, to be stronger in our faith or whatever else. We need a savior. We need Jesus. And when we understand this, we understand that the salvation that Jesus brings is so much greater than we ever realized. Because he wasn't just saving you from some mistakes that you've made. He wasn't just saving you from some bad choices. He was saving you from yourself. Because you are a sinner, and that's what causes you to sin. It's not that you're a sinner because you sin. You're a sinner that causes you to have those symptoms of sin. That's why laws don't improve people. We create all the laws that we want, and, and it may kind of hold us back a bit out of fear, which is really selfishness. We don't want to get punished for something. Right? But we don't make better people because we, we just continue to be sinners. I will never have a utopian society so much as, as, as people wish that we could because any utopian society or attempt thereof is going to be filled with who? Sinners. And so it's not going to be a utopia. It's going to be a sin-ridden place. There is no spark of goodness in us that we can tap into to, to somehow make ourselves good people. We're corrupted. We're, we're filled with sin. And that affects us, right? That makes us sinners. So what is the church for all this? Well, the church needs to be teaching the truth. Right? It needs to give us the truth and not be afraid to. But sometimes we see the church not as this place that's going to be real with us, but rather as a place that, that's just here to help us, right? I, I've talked to so many people who they say, I like going to church because it makes me feel better. It helps me to cope with my issues. Okay, well, that really, I mean, I'm glad for that. But, but that's really more therapy. You know, or, or others who say, I want, I want to go to church because I need to get stronger in my faith and I need to get, get better at, at doing the things I'm supposed to do and avoiding all the things I'm not supposed to do. I need to, I need to build up. But that, that's really more of a trainer, isn't it? One of the ones I remember from when I was growing up was the, the church's hospital. The church is a hospital, which on, on some levels I like because, you know, it admits at least that, that we're all sick. You know, then, then there's no, none of us are, are the ones who are the, the good ones. We're all sick. That's why we all go to church. But, but at the same time, why do you go to a hospital? You go to a hospital to get better, right? You see where this is going? You go to the hospital because you're trying to get better. And what happens then when you go to the church with the same idea in your mind? And, and, and we, we try and we try to get better and we, we do all these things, but then something happens. Right? And things get worse. Our lives blow up around us. Maybe it's the, the things that are going on in our lives. Maybe we, we fell into a sin. Or, or maybe, honestly, maybe more realistically, we just ran headlong into the sin. 
And maybe it was a new one. Maybe it's one that we thought we had overcome years ago. And yet there it is once again. And what do we do? Do we walk away? Do we, we, do we go to the church down the street who, who says they have the better plan that's going to help us to get better? Right? It just, it leaves us hopeless. But what if, what if we saw the church as hospice? I heard a, another pastor talking about uh, this concept, which was, and I can't remember his name offhand. I apologize for that. But, but he described it this way. And I, th- I thought, you know, this works. The church is hospice. When, when do you call hospice? You call them when you're dying. And the hospice people are, they're amazing people. And they're they are kind of their own breed, right? They speak truth. And they don't hide from it. They don't back down from it. And they don't. Uh, you know, they don't give out false hopes. Hey, there's some, some new treatment that maybe that'll pull you through, right? They look death square in the eye and they help you to deal with the fact that you're dying and they help your family to, to deal with that as well. And then walk with you through that. And that's really what's happening here, right? We're all dying. That is the consequence of sin. Like death came through sin and we're all dying. And what better place to go to die than the church? What do you think you're doing when you're baptized? The Bible tells us that when you are baptized, you are drowning that old Adam, right? That you are being buried with Christ. And who better? Jesus is the only one who was buried and then went on to live for all of eternity. That's who we want to be buried with. But the question isn't whether you're going to die. The question is whether you're going to die as a sinner or whether that sinner is going to be drowned and buried with Christ and then you raised to new life in Jesus. Right? That is the message that we need to hear. That is the truth. You know, sin is not just the, the, the symptom or the things that we do. It's, it's the deep problem that has to be dealt with. The sinner has to die. And Christ kills the sinner in baptism, but then raises us up to new life. Do you know who the first death in the Bible was? What is the first death in the Bible that was recorded? It was an animal, right? We read about it just a few minutes ago. It was an animal. Adam and Eve, as soon as they bit the apple, what did they do? They realized that they were naked. Why does that matter? Well, what matters is that before this, why, you know, really, I guess the question would be, why didn't they know it before? And that's because before everything was right and they were focused outward. Right? They were in this loving relationship with, with each other and with God and with even their stewardship of creation. They weren't inwardly focused, but when they bit that, that fruit, when they sinned, all of a sudden their hearts become inwardly focused. What's going on with me? And they realize they're naked. And they quit try to cover it up, right? They'd grab some fig leaves and they sew them together to try to cover up their shame. It doesn't work. It's like any of our efforts to cover up our shame. Plus, fig leaves are are itchy. But then God comes and what do they do? They hide from God. The very source of life, they hide from God. As if you could do that. You can't cover the shame with your own efforts. And you can't hide from God. But in their case, God sacrificed an animal and then covered them with his skin. They lived vicariously through the death of that animal. They were covered. Their shame was covered through the death of that animal. And that is exactly what Christ did, except in a bigger way. Because Christ was sacrificed for us. 
And the Bible tells us that when we believe in him, we are clothed with Christ. That he covers our shame and not just covers, he removes it. He washes it away with his own blood. He is the savior that we need. We live through the vicar- vicariously through the death of Jesus Christ. You know, the one complaint that I hear most often about original sin is why, how is it fair? How is it fair that I should be punished for what somebody else did years and years and years ago? And maybe you'd have a point. Maybe they would have a point, except that God, God put that sin and that death on Jesus. And he took the punishment for you and provided a way out. Now you can understand a person who complains and said, you know, when they, when they find out that they have some kind of a congenital disease, they say it's not fair. But if you then have someone who has the cure and says, hey, you don't have to have that. I can cure you with that. But they say, no, I don't want that. Well, now those complaints they don't really work anymore. Right? There is an answer, and that's Jesus. And ironically, our salvation comes from that very concept that we're complaining about. And we complain, how can I be punished for what someone else did? And yet our salvation comes because Jesus allowed himself to be punished for what we did. He took the death that we were supposed to die on himself so that we would not have to die. Not for eternity. So that we could have eternal life. And in that, he washes away our sins. You are perfect in him because he has declared you perfect. The wording in that uh, Romans 5 passage said uh, that we are justified. It's, It's the declaration like a judge declaring, and you have been declared righteous, perfect. And so you are, even though you still sin. We never fully rid ourselves of sin, not in this life. We can only trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we can't cover our own shame, but we can look to Jesus who covered it for us. And so then we can also live as Paul did and say with him as he finished that Roman 7 passage to say, wretched man that I am, who, who will deliver me? from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace and the mercy that you show us. And I have to, I have to confess that I am a sinner. We are all sinners. Lord, and it's not just a few things that we've done here and there. It's not even many things that we've done here and there. It goes all the way down to the root of us. We have a sinful nature, Lord, that we cannot overcome. And yet you gave us a Savior. And his sacrifice was greater than we could ever imagine. Lord, you clothed us in Christ to make us holy and righteous. You cleansed us from all that sin. Lord, drown the old Adam. May we live in a life of continual repentance and baptism, drowning the old Adam and then being raised again in Christ. May that be our life, to boast in Christ and Christ alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.